My name is Frank H. Crane. I was born in Victoria, January the 21st, 1921. And I grew up here in Victoria and graduated from high school and went off to college. I eventually entered law school in the summer of 1941 and uh, was in school when Pearl Harbor occurred. I think that Pearl Harbor happened 68 years ago, so there are not many people left who remember it. And it was a terrible experience for those who were old enough. Uh, I was on a picnic with my future wife and a cousin and a young officer from Foster Field when we received the news of Pearl Harbor. At first we were a little bit skeptical because Orson Welles had put on a production on radio called War of the Worlds that created a lot of panic. But uh, after 15 or 20 minutes, we realized it was true. So the young officer and my future wife, Biddy Bell, drove back here because he needed to report to Foster. The first thing we knew, we were on the losing side and that within a week, the Japanese had sunk two large British battleships and uh, things were in a turmoil. At that time, <clears throat> I was six weeks shy of my 21st birthday. And when I reached 21, I'd have to sign, register for the draft. <clears throat> and uh, we didn't know what to do. So the university uh, had a meeting in the gymnasium and all of the students were told to attend because they, we would find out something about our future, whether we'd be given deferments. As I remember, the only people who would most likely get deferments were men who were studying engineering. And when no one mentioned law, finally someone in the audience asked about law students and said that we would not have any deferments because we certainly don't need lawyers and the civilian workforce when you're at war. So not knowing what to do, I knew I would not be in law school long enough to accomplish anything. So during the Christmas holidays, I decided I would volunteer for the Army, which I did along with my brother-in-law, Leroy Bell, uh, we volunteered January the 3rd, 1942. At that time, we volunteered for the Ordnance Department, and the reason I did that, uh, one of my uncles was a professional soldier, and he was uh, the number two man in the, in the Ordnance Department until he retired, so it's the only thing I knew about. But, uh, we were sent to Dodd Field, which was a staging area in San Antonio. And then the next morning when we were called out for a formation, although having been told by older soldiers who were there, never volunteer, the instructor asked us if any one of us, if any of us knew close order drill. And I'd been to military school for one year, so I knew close order drill. That's all I knew about the military. And another man and I raised our hands. And I thought to myself, I'm on, man, I'm on the way. Well, we were told to report to a particular building pointing. And when we got to the building, there's a sergeant there asked us if we were if we knew close order drill, and we said yes. He said, fine, we're going to teach those other men how to drill. You two are on a garbage detail. So that's kind of how I started my military career in San Antonio. 
four of us were sent <coughs> from the Dodd Field in San Antonio to Ellington Field outside of Houston, about 15 to 20 miles out of Houston. We were in the Ordnance Department. I presume we were there to be for training. But uh, the only thing I did at Ellington Field was uh, once again, I'd say, stevedore work. They were moving, uh, moving supplies around. It was uh, historically cold winter. That's the winter that in Russia that wiped the German army out. The coldest winter in a hundred years. We scraped mud off the street. The only thing I I did that was out of the out of the ordinary is I was assigned the task of picking up two artillery shells, blanks to be fired at Reveille and Retreat. They had an old, old French 75 cannon that they fired at Reveille and Retreat. So I used to tell my friends I was important because of that. But at Ellington Field, uh, we didn't really get around to it. And uh, I think I was at Ellington Field at, on, on January the 8th about five days after I was in. One of the things when I was paid at Ellington Field, we only got $21 a month. <clears throat> By the time I was paid, when I, received, I got $7 and a nickel, and the, the lieutenant there was ROTC from LSU. And in the Army, you're paid in cash. You walk up to the desk, you salute, name, rank, serial number, and they physically count out the money. This fellow said to me, soldier, don't let that fall below $7. Well, they taken out for my haircut, they took out for old soldier's relief. I had to <laughs> control. And shortly thereafter, they raised the pay. But when I went in, it was $21 a month. When I was stationed at Ellington Field, there were 40 of us at least in our barracks, and only my brother-in-law and I uh, were attending college. But two of the men in there were illiterate. They said, "You know, you know, you you you, you college people, but we're going to have to teach." There was always a little uh, latent resentment. Sometime in early March, uh, I, was, uh, I was sent back to San Antonio, and uh, that's when I found I was on my way overseas. So I was only there about, uh, I was there about two months, a little over two months. And we uh, assembled in Charleston. South Carolina, and we were there for a few days. I tried to call home, and the telephone lines were jammed up. And uh, when we went on, we went aboard the ship. We thought we would be sailing, but we didn't. And the next day, the ship was still being loaded. And about middle of the afternoon. One of the non-commissioned officers told me to report to the wharf, and when I did, I found 25 or 30 other men, and they put us to work helping to load the ship. And uh, we finished that about five, six o'clock. And uh, that night, <coughs> we did sail. And ships and convoys zigzag, and you can only go as fast as the slowest ship in the convoy. Uh, our, our troop ship was the SS Brazil, which was a cruise liner uh, uh, for the South American tourist business. And then there was a small, much smaller ship that had civilian uh, technicians who we were told we're on their way to 
Egypt to help the British. The first place we stopped was in uh, Freetown, Africa. It was during the Easter holidays, and we stayed on the ship. And then from there we sailed to Cape Town and we're in port uh, long enough for us to be two days ashore. But, uh, our next stop was Port Elizabeth on the, the tip of Africa, a city I'd never heard of. And while I was there, I managed to send a cablegram to my father, simply telling him I was alive and well. On the troop transport, we only had two meals a day. So uh, when we got a chance to eat, we took advantage of it, and that's about all we did in Cape Town, I mean in Port Elizabeth. Every, every day we would have to report on deck. You were, you were never without your life preserver. The only time you could take your life preserver off is when you went to bed. And they had a stand in formation on the deck a half hour before and a half hour after sunrise and sundown because they thought the those were the time when you have a silhouette and be the easiest target for a submarine. Left the convoy, they went to Egypt and we took off without a convoy because uh, an escort, because we were, they could travel rapidly. We landed in Karachi, India. <clears throat> we landed May the 19th. It was 62 days. From Karachi, we were sent to Agra, and I had it's quite an experience to to travel on a troop train in India. I can guarantee you that. And when I was there, I did stevedore work. I loaded and unloaded 100-pound bombs, they, and occasionally there were 350-pound bombs. It would take two of us to... I went to the Taj Mahal, climbed up one of those minarets, which I shouldn't have done. When I got up there, I saw there were some Indians so I thought these people might try to throw me off of that, so I... And then in Allahabad, <clears throat> Allahabad, all we did was guard duty. See, if you don't have any, any, any specific skills, you don't, don't work in the office, you can't repair weapons, as which what ordinance is supposed to do, you end up you end up with sacking ammunition and moving it and guard, you know, just that. The only danger we were ever in <clears throat> in India was the, uh, sometimes we didn't know what we were guarding. The, uh, some of the local population was very hostile to us. And uh, what they would want is, is our weapons, but there wasn't any there wasn't any any fighting anywhere near where I was in India. Oh, we were it was just a way station for people who were flying the hump into to uh, China. But uh, supplies were sent from we were just a just a stopover air base, and then from there I was sent back to Agra. And then once, and then I was shipped back to Karachi. And when I was at Karachi, I was, I was assigned, all I did was make, help make practice bombs. And it's while I was at Karachi that I received word that my application for OCS had been approved. And that was in sometime in March. So, Counting my time on the troop transport, my time in India, and a, a couple of weeks it took to get home, I, I, I had about, about something over a year. 
I think I don't, the reason I got sent back, there wasn't any reason for him to send me back, except he was a he was an iron ass infantryman himself, and I'm probably the only person that applied for infantry. Had I been drafted, I'd have been put where they wanted. The infantry being the most dangerous, nobody would probably want it. I'll tell you later why I did it. But, uh, <clears throat> you're assigned to an army division, and uh, if they think you have some leadership, they'll make you a corporal, might make you a sergeant. These. These men have been trained in the infantry. They've been in, they've been in a, maybe a year. These are the kind of people you send off to be officers. You see? Now here I am, a private in the ordinance in India. And the reason I was sent is because General Stilwell, this is my thought, was an infantry. And he was so delighted to see someone. And I wanted, I wanted to see some action. I didn't want to spend my time lifting hundred-pound bombs and shoveling sand into these, and having. Uh, that's why I did it. See, I was the only enlisted man on that plane. Uh, it was being flown back. These were pilots who had piloted and brought planes to Italy. We were being sent back to bring more over. The plane was piloted by a civilian pilot. And I was so grateful that I could fly, otherwise, I don't know. And I met a fella on the plane who had, had been shot down. His plane had been shot down by a German submarine, which I'd never heard of. And when I was sent back from Florida, I went to Fort Benning, where I was supported. And then I had a few days leave to come to Victoria. I've forgotten how much, maybe seven, eight, or ten days. I naively, on the train, I said, I, I, I want to eat in the diner. They didn't have any diner. They had a, space, a diner for us. I didn't realize that, that we were having the best of it instead of the civilians. And uh, when I got to Fort Benning, I was so naive, I thought I'd just get an airline. Hell, I couldn't get a flight there. But. So I got a train ticket, stood up most of the way. When I got from Houston, we used to have a, they call it the doodle bug. It was a combination passenger, freight, interurban, electric. We start from Houston in the morning, Santonia in the morning. And we go from Santonia to here to Houston, and that was the route. And I got up to walk, and someone from Victoria recognized me. I limped a little bit, and someone said, Oh, he's back, he's been wounded. Then I, I graduated from OCS in September of 1943. <clears throat> And then five days later, I married. It was, our, it was our marriage. And from there, I went to Camp Fannin, where I engaged, where I became an instructor. I stayed there until May. And I'm not going to say, Biddy wouldn't want me to say this, but uh, when we left, when I was assigned to Colorado, she was pregnant. Most women would have gone home to mother. But she stayed with me. And we had a 1940 Mercury. And the tire, uh, the, my last tire blew out tw tw 27 miles out in the country, short of my base. So I had to go in, hitchhike in, and get up trailer, I mean a wrecker to come get me all this crap. And then the first day I reported for duty was in May, 
and I took the company out for some exercise, <clears throat> and we had a training film. <clears throat> so while we were going our way to the theater, it, it was, would you believe it was snowing a little bit? I decided I'd better run ahead to be sure that the, the doors at the theater were unlocked. So I ran a couple of blocks. And I'd already been feeling a little strange, and when I got there, I really felt, you know, something's wrong. So I asked the sergeant to take charge and went across the street to the dispensary, and they poked around on me, decided I had appendicitis, which I did. It was red hop. And I uh, <clears throat> sent to the hospital. Biddy was was in Leadville. It was just a mess. And uh, I was operated on by a dermatologist who hadn't operated in 15 years. And then from there, <clears throat> I had 30 days to report back, to report there. So we drove back down to Victoria and stayed here until when my 30 days were up. I joined it at Camp Swift, which is outside of Bastrop, you see. And uh, we had a plate. We were living in Austin. And in the infantry, you don't get to go home. It's not like the Air Force. You, I'd have, you know, I probably got home maybe three times a week. And uh, our first child was born while I was there. And this is purely, it's been out on maneuvers all night. And uh, it, when I came in, I would lay down on the ground. I slept on the ground a lot. Uh, that Biddy had had this had the baby, so um, and then from there we were sent. That's that's when the division. That's when we were sent to Italy, <clears throat> and we landed. At, our regiment went without our artillery, just an infantry regiment, and it was on the Argentina a sister ship of the replica of the Brazil that I'd gone to India as an enlisted man. And we landed at uh, Naples. And uh, Christmas Day I went to church, the only Episcopal chaplain I ever saw. And when we got out of church, they said, we, you know, something's happened. And what had happened, uh, we didn't know, but we, they sent us, I had the unique experience of being on a transport, an Italian transport with the Italian Navy escorting us to Levern, Legern, it's called Livorno in Italian. Once again, a place I'd never heard of. And I remember as we were approaching it, <clears throat> there was, saw a lot of anti-aircraft firing. And when they got off the ship, that we headed north and I, after driving for maybe 35 or 40 minutes, I saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa, so I knew about where I was. And we were sent to back up, if necessary, to stop this, this, actually, it, it was more Italian than German, attack. The lines in Italy were, were thinly held because most, most of the soldiers were sent to England to, to take place, to take part in the invasion of Normandy. So we were stretched thin. I, I was hit by something, I don't know. We all had something happen to us, but uh, I was not an infantry platoon leader. I was, I told you, I did these other things. I was, I was frequently in a dangerous situation, but uh, we lost the highest casualty rates are platoon leaders. Oh, see, the infantry makes up 15% of the army and suffers 70% of the casualties. 
and uh, I would say out of the original uh, original group of us, there were only four or five of us were still around when the war ended. Now, none of them that I knew in our original group were killed, but but they were wounded enough to where they get back. They used to have what they call a million dollar wound. It was a wound that would get you out of action, but not really <laughs> handicap you. So I, for the short time we were in the line, we were in the line 114 days, and we suffered, uh, we had over a thousand killed and about 3,500 wounded. Uh, there was a mountain mountain uh, mass that we our people captured. It's the only time they use rock climbing technique. <clears throat> and then um, we lost another our second campaign. <clears throat> we still had we had mules, the mule pack outfit, and we were attacking the units on our left and right at heavy artillery, they were going to attack and we were going to, you know, stupid, that the Germans wouldn't be watching us because there wasn't any, well, they were. And when, when we got out the ways, the, these, these mules were huge. Some, some of them got away and ran out in minefields and were blown up and they took off with our equipment. Uh, it took us all the next morning collecting our machine guns and whatnot. <coughs> and then uh, <coughs> we moved, that's when we start our final drive. And then uh, we crossed the Po Valley and then uh, went into uh, Lake Garda, which is a long, narrow lake one side was the lake. The road had been cut into a cliff. When we got to the head of that, the Germans had, uh, that's where they stopped to, you know, to oppose us. And while I was up there, I, I came across what we'd call a war crime. Uh, I was walking down this road and I saw a couple of soldiers and in a couple of couple of German soldiers lying on the ground. Now when I got up, I saw they'd been shot, and I said, well, "You know what? What happened, man?" One of them said that there was some big, tall lieutenant came down off of this that mountain and walked up in our direction. And when he got to where we were, he suddenly pulled up his carbine and shot him. Then he went back up from whence he came. Well, I knew, I knew who he was talking about because this fellow was a psycho that was assigned to us, and he wasn't given any command. I'm reliably informed that he that he he, he was killed that day himself. He was a one-man army. And I spent most of my time doing what I've just told you. I did some patrol work. I, I tell people I was in command of the troops at the Battle of Montese, not Varese. I was in charge of Montese, but Varese was another place. So uh, the colonel said, Frank, <coughs> We don't know whether the Germans are, st are occupying Montese or not, but uh, why don't you go out there tonight and find out? So I selected from five or six guys, and we took some we took some landmines with us to lay across the road, so if the German tanks, you know. And we got there, and if you want to see a Frankenstein set, it'd been heavy artillery on this. 
and there was still a fire or something. Most of the buildings, a lot of the buildings were, you know, destroyed. But fires were burning and shadows everywhere. It was a spooky damn thing. So we went into the, down the main street. And we thought we saw some people at the other end of the street. And uh, we think they saw us. Uh, we don't know. I didn't know that for sure. But we couldn't find any. <coughs> you know, we kept looking. We, did, we couldn't find anybody. <coughs> so I laid, the, laid our minds and went back. That's the Battle of Montesi. Would I do that as a joke? Oh, you were? Yeah, well, certainly. <laughs> we were going cross-country, and you put panels on the truck so that our people, there weren't any German airplanes flying. They'd, been, they'd all withdrawn from Italy. I Italy was a backwater for the Germans. So and <clears throat> we stopped. There were trees an open field to, to my right facing back. <clears throat> I got out of the truck just walking around to limber up. And this P-38 was kind of reminded me of somewhat of a crop duster. Kind of flying, you know, just around. <clears throat> and then I you saw him go out, and loop up and then head toward, and I thought to myself, Certainly, he knows we're friendly. And I didn't feel any danger, O.C., because it was half a block or more. I knew he wasn't going to hit me. And he opened up with eight machine guns on our convoy. <clears throat> and then, gosh, it's been 20 years ago, about I say the late 18, 19, 18, 1980s, a group of us went to uh, South Padre and then went to Harlingen to see the Confederate air show. And we got to visiting around, and, and you know, I like to talk, and got to visiting with this man who said he was in Italy, said he was a gunner on a bomber, and then I related to him what I related to you. And he's the one who told me that, that that plane was being piloted by a German pilot, that the Germans had captured a number of our P-38s unscathed and were using them. They would work their way into the, the bomber formation and then fire on our bombers. So he said, we were told if it's a P-38, it's the enemy. So they they took them all out of the out of the theater. <clears throat> Came to a bridge, and in Italy, it was a crime to cut down a tree, for example, because they didn't have many, and mostly masonry. And this was a bridge <clears throat> that had uh, solid masonry sides about this about this high and there had been a hole blown in the middle of it so I said Frank go out go out and do something <clears throat> so when we went out uh, they opened up on us with them with a couple of machine guns and uh, we, of course we ducked down behind these solid walls but we scurried back to the, <laughs> off the bridge. And right at that area, there was a little wine shop. And we waited a while, because we thought this was just a, a delaying action. But we were thirsty, so we had a few. All they had was wine. You didn't dare drink the water. We started back out. He opened fire on us again, so we ducked down and ran back. But by this time, the wine was acting on us. So we got up. By the time we went out the third time, they had withdrawn. 
we suffered a few casualties from men drinking. Uh, it, it, the, the country people drank Chianti. It was the cheapest wine over there. And it was about supposedly strong enough to kill most organisms, but not enough to. But we had guys, you know, going cross country <coughs> and they'd get to drink, you know, sipping this wine. And if something happened, a shell comes in, their reactions are slowed a little bit. So we were told, we told these men, don't do this because it, you know, it'll sneak up on you. German forces in Italy have surrendered unconditionally to the supreme Allied commander. The instrument of surrender, the first formal surrender by a German army or armies since Allied troops first stormed the shores of Europe nearly 20 months ago, was signed at 2.14 Italy time on Sunday afternoon, April 29th. The surrender became effective at 2 p.m. Italy time today. All German and Italian forces under General Heinrich von Wiedinghoff, successor to Marshal Kesselring as Commander-in-Chief of the German Southwest Command, formally laid down their arms just four and a half hours ago. The war in Italy is over. The German army surrendered as a unit in Italy, which meant they were internees as against POWs. And we fought for two or three, we fought for at least two days or more uh, after the agreement, had, after they'd surrendered. So we went through the German lines with German MPs directing us and whatnot and occupied a mountain pass where Switzerland, Austria, and Italy come together. And uh, we stayed there, had a unique experience. A German colonel and his two aides contacted us the next day to show us where our quarters were. The colonel was, you know, just dressed in combat clothing had a machine, had a submachine gun with him. His two aides were immaculately dressed. They were about six four, blondes, what you know, huge guys. I think they were there to intimidate us. Yeah, who won this war? <laughs> and then from there, <clears throat> they shipped us over to where. Yugoslavia and Austria and Italy come together to keep Marshal Tito from invading Italy. And while I was there, I had another unique experience. Our colonel, commanding officer, his name was John Hancock Hay, was a fellow who, very independent kind of a man. And we, we had the Partisans, Tito partisans. We had Mikhailovich partisans who were royalists. We had Italian communist partisans. And we had Italian royal partisans. They were for the monarchy. And we found out, the colonel found out that some of the Tito people had captured a, a Mikhailovich man and holding him prisoner. And he sent word to him, you know, to release him. It's six o'clock. He then assembled the officers in the battalion, or the, the regiment really by then. None of the enlisted men. And we, we, we formed up in the town plaza <clears throat> with our carbines, carbines, and uh, I dress you, not a, a, it wasn't a farmer, but I, you know, I, I guess it's a dress uniform. And uh, at six o'clock, he called us to attention, right face, and we started marching to the headquarters of this Tito outfit out of town. And when they saw us coming, they f turned him loose, opened the door, and really shoved him out. And you won't find that. Uh, he had no authority to, to do such a thing. 
but that's the way he was. He, something needed to be done, he'd do it. He had a distinguished career in the Army later. Then I was in Allied military government for, I don't remember, for, I was there in Allied military government in the city of Cremona. And a man named Farinacci, who was one of Mussolini's early supporters and a rabid supporter of Mussolini and a pro-German, had a house, a magnificent home in Cremona, where our prefect was living. And he invited us there one night. This, this house was, when you opened the door in that house, a light would come on so you'd never walk into a dark room. And uh, it was while, <clears throat> while I was stationed there that the atomic bomb was dropped. And uh, I was shipped from Cremona to Milan, where I lived in a hotel. I had a funny thing happen there. <laughs> and uh, then from Milan, I was shipped <clears throat> I've forgotten the name, it was out in the country somewhere, to the prisoner of war. And while I was there, it was just, you know, stepping stone. I was, happened to be officer of the day. <clears throat> and my driver and my orderly, who was supposed to be your bodyguard, were German soldiers, <laughs> spoke, spoke good English. And then from there, I was shipped to Naples. And I don't know how long I was there, but, but eventually I started home. And it was a slow, it was a Liberty ship, I think. And uh, they traveled about, you know, about 11, 12, 13 miles an hour. <laughs> so it took a while to get home. I, I served in the military actively from January the 3rd, 1942, until December the 27th of 1945. Uh, that's, that's one week shy of uh, four years. I remained, uh, I remained in the Army on an inactive reserve, which was a requirement of all officers so uh, I served from 1945 until sometime in 1953 in the reserve subject to call and was alerted to be called up to go to Korea. The Army writes subject to so-and-so subject. It was to me, the subject was recalled to active duty. That was a Friday, I'll never forget it, Friday during the noon hour. I'd been out looking at an oil and gas lease. And then in early March, uh, 1951, I took a physical, which I passed. And uh, the only thing, I don't know why I wasn't called, because I, I was the kind of person they were looking for, one who had not served 200 days or more in combat. I was discharged, uh, I was discharged, uh, went back to law school. I entered law school in March of 1946. And, uh, I passed the bar exam in February of 48, but I didn't graduate till May. And I came back to Victoria. I looked around a little bit in Houston, and one of the prominent lawyers over there suggested, why don't you come back here? <coughs> so I came back to Victoria to practice law in 1948. And uh, Senator William Fly was a state representative, and 
he decided he'd been serving since 46, and he decided he didn't want to run anymore, so some folks here asked me to run for the legislature, which I did. I served one term and didn't particularly enjoy it. Uh, a lot of petty things go on. And then they wanted me to run for county judge. So I ran for county judge and said I'd serve one term. Well, at the end of that term, we had something, we had things going on. I said, well, one more term. And uh, in July, <clears throat> late June of 1959, uh, the district judge, Judge Frank Martin from Goliad, died. So a number of people urged me to uh, seek that appointment, which I did. And I uh, was eventually appointed by Price Daniel, and I took office, uh, I want to say July the 8th, I'm not sure. And I served until uh, August the 15th, 1988. And after that, I went, went into private practice 